Hello, um, everyone who's watching this. I'm just gonna aim to run through this paper um, from 2016, I think, in about 30 minutes. Um, so we'll see how it works. Um, so let's just jump into it. Um, first question. Um, DI is a condition that results in excessive thirst and the excretion of large amounts of dilute urine. The main cause of DI is a deficiency of ADH. ADH normally binds to receptor proteins on cell surface membranes of cells in the collecting ducts, ducts of nephrons. Outline the effect of ADH on the collecting ducts. Okay, so um, ADH, the antidiuretic hormone, um, if something is a diuretic, like coffee, um, it means that it will increase the production of urine, so ADH has the opposite effect. So how does it do that? Um, so it makes the collecting duct more permeable um, by um, encouraging the some vesicles uh, containing aquaporins to fuse with uh, the membrane um, so that um, water can be reabsorbed by osmosis down its concentration gradient into the um, interstitial fluid, um, into the medulla. Okay, cool. Next one. An inherited form of DI may be caused by faulty membrane receptors. These receptors are coded for by a sex-linked allele. Okay, explain the terms uh, sex linkage. So um, I'm sure you already <laughs> know this one. So um, sex linkage um, is when the allele um, is carried on the X chromosome rather than an autosomal chromosome. Um, next, Use a genetic diagram to show how parents who do not have this condition can have a child with the inherited form of DI. Okay, so the key point here here is that the parents don't have the condition. So from that you can um, already deduce that um, it's going to be um, a recessive trait, the DI allele. So you can write, sorry about my writing, so A would be normal. And small a would be the di. And then, um, so the mother doesn't have the condition, and since it's on the X chromosome, then she must be a carrier. And since the father doesn't have the condition either, he has a normal allele and the Y chromosome. Okay, so the gametes would be these four, if you were to, sorry, I'm not going to write it again. <laughs> so like that. And then the offspring, if you do your Punnett square, um, you would get um, a female, a homozygous um, dominant female. So X capital A, X capital A, um, heterozygous female. So if you were to put these two together, so capital uh, X capital A, X small a, um, then you could also have um, a male with the normal allele, so X capital A, Y. And then finally, um, in one of the offspring could be have, have DI, which would be male. Okay, cool. Next. Grass crops such as maize, sorghum and sugarcane are C4 plants. They're common grass crops of top tropical regions. Oats and wheat commonly grown in temperate regions are C3 plants. Most plants are C3. They're termed C3 because the first product of photosynthesis is three carbon compound. Outline how the biochemistry of C4 plants differs from that of C3 plants. Okay, so this question, I think the easiest um, mark to get is to remember that what C4 stands for. So um, the first uh, product of C4 photosynthesis would be um, a four carbon compound. So you can um, add what that is, oxaloacetate, which then gets converted to malate or aspartate. Um, and then another one, a good one is that the um, first um, carbon dioxide acceptor is PEP um, instead of um, ribulose bisphosphate which that happens at a later stage in um, uh, that allows it happens at a later stage because of the Kranz anatomy, um, which doesn't happen in C3. Um, and then you can also mention that, you know, that the um, 
uh, the four carbon compound gets um, transported into uh, a, 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 another cell um, in which the um, carbon dioxide is released um, to concentrate the carbon dioxide and make rubisco more efficient. Okay, next. Um, C4 pathway for fixing carbon dioxide was worked out in 1966 by Hatch and Slack. During their investigation, they measured the rates of fixation of carbon dioxide at high light intensities in leaves removed from both temp temperate and tropical grasses. They also measured the rates of activity of two carboxylic enzymes, Rubisco and PEP carboxylase. Okay, and all of them were measured at 30 degrees C. Okay, so immediately um, these will be our C4. Plants, C4, and these are our C3 plants. Okay, so the question is, with reference to Table 2.1, compare the rates of fixation of carbon dioxide in C3 and C4 um, grasses. So you can see um, the first thing maybe to uh, mention is that the just that the, the PEP, yeah, so that the C4, the rate in C4 um, grasses is higher than C3. Um, and you can also tell that there is um, a bit more variation in these values than in these values. Okay, great. Um, next, describe the role of Rubisco in the Calvin cycle. Okay, so this one is one of those recalling questions. Um, so you can just say, um, you know, fixation of carbon um, by catalyzing the reaction between um, uh, Ruby P and uh, carbon dioxide to uh, produce phosphoglycerate um, via a 6-3 Sorry, 6C compound. Right, okay. Cool. With reference to Table 2.1, suggest reasons for the differences in activity of the two carboxylase enzymes in C3 and C4 grasses. Okay, so that being Rubisco and PP carboxylase. Okay, so you can see that um, PP carboxylase um, if you look at this one first, has a much higher um, rate of activity in C4 plants than in C3. Um, and so you can maybe, you know, assume uh, that there is more PEP in C4. Um, and so the rate of photosynthesis may be faster in um, high light and temperature climates where C4 plants live. Um, so that means that there would be a lower concentration of carbon dioxide as well. Um, so if C3 has a higher concentration of um, carbon dioxide, then um, if you jump over to Rubisco, then you would see that Rubisco would in fact have a higher rate in C3. Um, and actually, um, I've read a paper recently that there is a um, the worry about the fact that um, C3 in general, there's evidence that C3 plants in general are more efficient um, than C4 at higher carbon dioxide concentrations. So there is a worry that because um, due, due to climate change, there is an increase in carbon dioxide. Um, C4 may not be as viable as C3. OK, but you don't have to go into that much detail. OK. Next. It has been calculated that to produce one molecule of glucose, the C3 pathway uses 18 molecules of ATP and the C4 pathway uses 30 molecules of ATP. Suggest why C4 plants can afford this high cost of ATP. OK, so again, going back to the fact that um, they're adapted for high light um, intensities and temperatures, um, they can afford to spend the ATP because, um, uh, you know, they have the resources to, to produce um, ATP, which might not be the case in environments where C3 plants um, live. Okay, next question, question three. 
Um, PCR is used to produce large amounts of DNA from a very small original sample. The main stage of PCR is shown in figure 3.1. Okay, so DNA sample heated, cooled, timers are added, and then incubated at 72 with the polymerase, and then the cycle starts again. Okay, explain why the DNA sample is heated to 95 degrees C. Okay, so um, in order to copy um, your strands of DNA, you need the templates. So you need to separate your double-stranded um, DNA. And um, one of the ways to do this is to um, break the hydrogen bonds by increasing the temperature um, to 95 degrees um, to denature your DNA. Okay. Explain why primers are added in step two. Okay, so you can mention a number of different things. Um, one of them is, uh, so the temperature needs to be lowered for um, hydrogen bonds to form again. Um, and um, you need the, um, so the, your primers need to anneal to your target sequence. And you also need to specify for the DNA polymerase where to start copying. Um, if you only want to amplify like a fragment from your long DNA sample that you start out with. Um, and then finally, you could also mention that it reduces the probability of reannealing of the, your original DNA, um, your DNA strands. Um, so it also um, will reduce the chance of copying wrong sequence. OK. Explain why the enzyme TAC polymerase is used in step three. Okay, so this one, um, TAC polymerase is derived from uh, Thermos aquaticus, which is a thermophilic bacterium that lives in um, hydrothermal vents. Um, so its polymerase needs to be more stable at higher temperatures, which is achieved by, um, you know, having um, more disulfide bridges in the tertiary structure. Um, and so... Um, the polymerase doesn't need to be added in each cycle because um, it can withhold higher temperatures without denaturing. Um, and it's raised, uh, the temperature is raised to 72%, 72 degrees C, sorry, um, because that's been um, determined to be the um, ideal temperature at which um, it's the most efficient. Okay. Next, after an organism dies, its DNA gradually breaks down. However, cells in bones that were buried hundreds of years ago may still yield small amounts of DNA that can be extracted amplified using PCR and then analyzed. Mitochondrial DNA is often used because there are uh, usually more than 100 copies of it in one cell compared to with only two copies of nuclear DNA. Uh, for example, in 1994, uh, mitochondrial DNA from bones that had been found in a grave in Russia was analyzed to confirm that these uh, were the remains of the royal family who've been killed in 1918. OK, great. And then the, those um, extracted DNAs were then compared with a living relative. OK, so here is the diagram that shows here is the living relative. And these are the bones that were found. Um, and the first question, explain why there are usually more than 100 copies of uh, mitochondrial DNA in a cell, but only two copies of um, nuclear DNA. So um, only two copies of nuclear DNA um, because it's a deploy deployed autosomal cell, so you have two copies um, of your nuclear DNA, but um, and and one nucleus. But within the cell, you can have several mitochondria, um, maybe even hundreds. So you have more copies of that DNA. And then um, all the mitochondria. Um, in a zygote come from the egg, not the sperm. List the letters of the people in the family tree who would be expected to have mitochondrial DNA identi identical to the mitochondrial DNA of the living relative G. Okay, so it gets passed on from the mother. So you can see Queen Victoria had two granddaughters. And so therefore, this person will have the same one as her. And so will the living relative. So that works out great for us because that means she will also have it. But because she's also um, a female, that means that all of her offsprings will inherit mitochondrial DNA from her. So that means Olga will have the same um, mitochondrial DNA as so will Alexei. So the only odd one out is Nicholas. Great. OK. Next. Thank you. 
Spraying insecticides on the walls inside houses is the main method of controlling a species of mosquito in rural India. A number of different insecticides have been used. Malathion, Malathion, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, was the main insecticide used for many years. In 2005, the, a, the newer insecticide, deltametrin, was used instead, and the use of malathion was discontinued. A lab study was carried out um, using mosquitoes collected from two sites in India. The percentage of mosquitoes killed by malathion and deltametrin was estimated. Okay. With reference to table 4.1, describe the difference in effectiveness of the two insecticides. Okay, so um, straight away, what you can see immediately um, is that uh, deltametrin is um, much more, uh, it's, it works much better than malathion in general, um, more effective at killing mosquitoes. Um, and you but you can also see that in Jamnagar, the um, from 2005 to 2007, the effectiveness of deltametrin has decreased, whereas malathion has increased in both places. Um, OK. Next. Researchers concluded that at Jamnagar, the mosquitoes had evolved resistance to deltametrin. Explain how the mosquitoes evolved resistance. OK, so in this question, um, you can talk about um, how uh, a random mutation has resulted in a trait that um, allowed for uh, resistance to um, occur. So maybe a mutation in an enzyme or um, a gene. Um, on which the um, insecticides worked in susceptible um, individuals. Um, and since deltametrin acts as um, a selection pressure, um, the resistant mosquitoes can survive and proliferate. So directional selection occurs. And therefore, the effectiveness of um, deltametrin has decreased, which we see here from 100% to 90%. Explain how the data in Table 4.1 show evidence that the use of malathion was discontinued after 2005. Okay, so essentially you can see that in both places um, the effectiveness of malathion has increased. So the one of the reasons why this could be is that um, uh, the the selection pressure of the of um, having resistant mosquitoes to malathion has uh, been removed. Um, so, uh, so being resistant to this insecticide is, um, no more, uh, it's, it's not a selective advantage anymore. Um, so, so if there is less resistant mosquitoes, um, then the insecticide is going to be more effective, which is the case as we see. Okay. The resistance of mosquitoes to malathion was found to be due to a difference in the shape of one enzyme, namely the type of variation controlling malathion resistance in the mosquito population. Okay, so again, um, um, recalling factual knowledge, um, it's uh, a qualitative um, trait. So it's uh, mosquitoes either resistance or it's not re resistant to the insecticide or it's not. So this is called um, discontinuous. Variation. Okay, great. Some students suggested that resistance to malathion could be due to a gene with two alleles. They proposed that the allele for resistance to malathion would be dominant to the allele for non-resistance. Okay, using this assumption, the data in Table 4.1 can be used to calculate the frequency of resistant mosquitoes and the frequency of allele for resistance in a mosquito. Okay, yeah. Use the hardy weinberg principle to calculate the frequency P for the allele resistance in Jamnagar in 2005. Okay, so Jamnagar 2005, um, if we go back up there, then we can see that 76% um, of mosquitoes were killed by malathion. Um, so hardy weinberg principle P plus Q equals 1, P squared plus 2PQ equals one. So um, the allele for resistance is dominant to the allele for non-resistance. So um, our 76% uh, was for 
non-resistant um, mosquitoes, which it equals Q squared. So if Q squared is 0.76, then we have already found Q. Square root that, 0.87. And then using um, this equation, um, we can find P. Which is 0.13. Oops. Cool. Okay. Um, the land area, the land area of Italy is composed of forest, grasslands, including agricultural fields, build up areas, and inland water bodies like lakes and rivers. Table 5.1 shows changes in the area covered by these environments over a 15 year period. Okay. Explain why none of the three environments um, listed above can be referred to as an ecosystem. So ecosystem sort of like a um, self-contained unit. It's a system um, that, you know, within the system, um, there is lots of biotic and abiotic factors that can interact with each other. Um, and if you have a forest in northern Italy, in the Alps versus in southern Italy or different lakes, they don't really have a spatial um, interaction with each other. So they can have completely different ecosystems and, you know, uh, different variations and number of species and um, all those kinds of things in different climates. So they cannot be referred to as an ecosystem. Um, then let's see. Um, the increase in area covered by forests in Italy has occurred uh, because farmers have cultivated less of their land or have abandoned their farms altogether. Describe how this change in land use may affect biodiversity. You should consider the three different levels. Okay, so firstly, maybe list three levels. So those would be variations um, in ecosystems and habitats. Um, then, so, you know, the climate, um, um, warmer, colder, or the different roles that the species play within the ecosystem. Then another one is the number of species and species abundance, and then genetic variation, so alleles um, or genes. Um, yeah, so you can just say that there is an increase in variety. Uh, one of so because um, if you have, for example, the easiest analogy. But this works for fields as well. But if you have, if you build a road um, in the middle of a forest, then the two halves of the forests are more likely to be um, separated from one another. So you reduce um, uh, the biodiversity in the sense that um, you know individuals from that were happen to be on one side of the road can no longer connect. So you also reduce your genetic variation and the species variation. So by sort of um, returning these um, f um, agricultural areas to forest, you may um, increase biodiversity. Okay, great. Two large mammals, uh, grey wolf and the lynx. Here they are. Um, here are some facts. Um, so uh, fewer than 100 wolves in Italy in the 70s um, and lynx were extinct. Uh, but they were reintroduced to Switzerland and Slovenia. And, um, you know, in 2014, uh, the number of wolves have increased and lynx that were pre previously thought to be extinct in Italy have, has, uh, were 25. Okay. Suggest what actions may have been necessary at local, national, global levels to contribute to the successful conservation of biodiversity of Italy's large mammals. So there's lots of different things that you can mention here. So I'm not going to list all of them, um, you know, one of the maybe the more um, obvious ones that you can think of is that um, local incentives such as compensation for, you know, returning farmland um, to the forest or stopping hunting um, can be introduced. Um, conservation schemes um, or, you know, the uh, maybe sort of a more global approach would be to have cross-border loss because some habitats um, can span borders. So, you know, you could set up an agreement um, to have national parks around the border. Um, and there is a number of different answers that you can write here. So it's only your imagination, I assume, and the marking scheme. 
<laughs> okay, question six. I'm just quickly going to check how um, we're doing for time. 25, okay. I think I need to speed up a little bit. So, um, this uh, graph shows um, the concentration of four hormones in a woman's body during one menstrual cycle. Okay, reference to this figure, explain why there is a large increase in luteinizing hormone. Okay, so at lower concentrations, um, estrogen um, prevents the um, release of um, FSH and LH, but when it gets to about four times the concentration, um, then it um, induces a quick surge of luteinizing hormone, which um, um, then results in ovulation. Okay. State how figure 6.1 shows that the woman did not become pregnant during this cycle. Okay, so um, as the corpus luteum um, uh, degenerates towards the end of the cycle, um, the progesterone levels fall, which would not happen if the um, female were to become pregnant. So that's this part of the graph shows that um, the cycle starts again. Okay. Sorry, water break. Okay. The combined oral contraceptive pill contains estrogen and progesterone. Explain how this combined contraceptive pill works to prevent pregnancy. Okay. So uh, the pituitary gland produces um, FSH and LH, which is inhibited by estrogen. So there is no follicle maturation, um, which also prevents um, ovulation. And in addition to that, you can also mention that um, the cervical mucus um, thickens, which stops any uh, sperm as well. And um, OK, great. So if there's no follicle to be to, de to develop, then there is no ovulation to take place. Suggest why some women take the combined contraceptive pill for just the first 21 days of their cycles. OK, so this is to um, um, allow for the um, uterine uh, line to be shed. So um, sort of mimicking the natural. Um, uh, the natural cycle of the body. Some women have contraceptive device inserted under their skin. This releases hormones into the blood and can last for up to three years. Just one advantage. Okay, so um, one advantage would be that there is no menstruation and no hormonal imbalances um, because uh, the hormones um, are at a consistent level. So this would um, deter any sort of side effects that you can get with the combined contraceptive pill. For example, you know, mood swings or weight gain or any other side effects. Um, and you wouldn't have to remember to take it at the same time. And also um, the absorption of the pill depends on um, a variety of different things. So you can get even more fluctuation of hormonal levels depending on when you take it or with how much food or your metabolism and um, all those kinds of things. OK, next. Um, figure 7.1 shows the mammalian neuromuscular junction. Um, on figure 7.1, use label lines and letters to label each of the following parts. OK, region containing only actin. OK, so actin is um, is the thinner filament. So you can label any of these actin. And um, a region containing both actin and myosin. So those would be um, any of your sort of overlapping regions. So. Sorry. <laughs> Trying to draw where the mouse isn't easy. <laughs> okay. Outline how an action potential arriving at this neuromuscular junction can result in depolarization of the sarcolemma. Okay, great. So um, this one, um, this one is uh, pretty straightforward. So um, as your calcium channels open um, at the motor end plate um, due to the action potential arriving. Um, your, there is an influx of um, calcium ions, um, which um, result in the fusion of fusion of vesicles um, with the membrane that contain um, um, acetylcholine, which can then diffuse across the synaptic cleft, 
and bind on a receptor at the sarcolemma. Um, and then that uh, will then result in um, NA plus channels to open and an influx of into the sarcoplasm, which means that the, your, the sarcoplasm will be depolarized. Okay. Then this one, um, I won't spend too much time on this, um, but let's just go through it quickly. So um, we already have T and Z. So Cholpenin change place and so shape and the sarcomere shortens. So the first thing to take place, um, the sarcolemma gets depolarized. Um, so that's number one. Then uh, the second one is uh, the transverse tubules get depolarized. So and then third is um, because of the depolarization, the um, uh, calcium channels will open in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so the calcium ions diffuse out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Then, um, because of that, the calcium ions can now bind to the troponin, um, and this binding uh, causes the troponin to change place, the shape, um, and the tropomycin can then move, uh, which um, which results in uh, the binding site on, on actin to be exposed, um, which consequently uh, means that your myosin head can bind to the actin. And then uh, finally, the myosin head can tilt and uh, the sarcomere shortens. Great. Okay. When a dormant seed absorbs water, it will start to germinate and its rate of respiration will increase. Name the plant growth regulator involved in the initiation of uh, the germination of seeds. OK, so this was another one that you either um, know or you don't. Um, so that's gibberellin. And a respirometer can be used to measure the rate of respiration of germinating seeds. So this is the setup. State the role of potassium hydroxide. Um, so we would ideally like our liquid to move only because um, oxygen is being used up. So we would like to eliminate any other um, sources of um, movement. So the potassium hydroxide is there to um, absorb the CO2. OK. Um, as respiration takes place, oxygen is used by the seeds and the colored liquid moves down the tube. Describe the role of oxygen in aerobic respiration. So three marks. Um, so there's a number of different things that you can say, um, including that um, oxygen is the final electron acceptor, um, which allows your electron, tr electron transport chain to continue um, for by forming water and accepting protons. Um, and indirectly, it's involved in ATP production by um, fa facilitating the um, uh, proton gradient to build up, and then it can diffuse down its concentration gradient um, through ATP synthase. Okay, respirometers, as shown in figure 8.1, were used to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of respiration of germinating pea seeds. Okay, so I'm not going to read this out because I'm short for time. So um, Basically, there were two um, controls and two different um, temperatures. Um, so this A was at 10, measured at 10 degrees, and C was measured at 25 degrees C. So the first one is asking um, why the respirometers were left for 10 minutes. So this is for you know, to um, leave time for us, I mean, equilibra equilibration. And then B and D um, were just the controls. So um, to control four variables other than temperature, which is the variable that we would like to measure, ideally. Um, and then, So you're controlling for um, other variables like weight or et cetera. OK, great. Calculate the rate of oxygen uptake in centimeter cube per minute for respirometer C between five and 20 minutes. OK, so um, looking at this curve at um, 20 minutes, you had 1.7. And five minutes, 
you had zero point four here. Okay, so during this time, uh, one point three um, was taken up, but um, the answer is in per minute. So you have to divide that by fifteen minutes. So between five and twenty, that's fifteen, and Therefore, you get 0.87 to two significant figures, uh, centimeter cube per minute, but luckily they have um, the units there. Okay. Explain why there's an increased rate of respiration of germinating species between 10 and 25. Okay. Um, so here, this is, um, again, just asking for some standard answers. So I won't spend too much time on it. So if there's increased kinetic energy, um, then uh, there is the idea that um, um, all of uh, the cellular processes um, will be taking place quicker. Uh, so the enzymes, uh, yeah, so there, if there's more kinetic energy, then the enzymes can function quicker. So um, there is uh, increased rate of respiration. Okay. Suggest so why carrying out the experiment at 50 degrees C would result in lower rate of respiration. So this is asking um, for you to mention uh, denaturation of enzymes. So um, if the temperature is too high, then your um, hydrogen bonds can break and you won't get the correct tertiary structure and your the integrity of the active sites is will be ruined. OK. And finally, um, I won't spend too much time going through all of these points because it's in the mark scheme. I'm just going to mention um, maybe some ideas on how to structure it that could help. So the first one, using examples, outline the importance of homeostasis in a mammal. So um, you can define homeostasis. Uh, so, you know, uh, main maintenance of a constant um, internal environment. Um, and then you can mention some of some examples. So what are some examples that you can think of? So um, thermal homeostasis, um, water potential, um, blood glucose. And then you can sort of think through the different scenarios. So what happens in lower temperatures? So, you know, um, you can think of vasoconstrictions, shivering. Then with, if it's a high temperature, then, you know, vase dilation. Or if it's the water potential is low, then you would get the shrinking of cells or if it's too high, which would stop cell functions. But if it's too high, then they would burst. So you can mention the kidneys and how that kind of works, sort of a callback to the first question. And then blood glucose, um, you can just mention um, glucagon and insulin. OK, next, describe the main stages of I'm just quickly going to check time. OK, great. Perfect. OK, describe the main stages of cell signaling and the control of blood glucose concentration by adrenaline. OK, great. So if you um, did the first one, that's already a little bit of help. So again, I won't go through the steps um, too much. Uh, so you can think of um, when uh, it, adrenaline would be used in the body. So you would like to um, increase your metabolic rate. So if you think um, in the same scenario as when blood glucose levels levels fall. So then you can think of, you know, um, what kind of cells are involved. So the alpha cells uh, will um, release your glucagon and then the beta cells will lower uh, the production of insulin. And then um, you can just sort of describe the signaling cascade um, exactly as the markings. So some of the keywords um, that you need to um, mention are um, your um, the amplification of signal at each level. So at when the, uh, so the signaling cascade and, um, what the second messenger is, uh, you know, the kind, the kinases that are involved. And then finally, what the final product is, um, is that you would like more glucose in the blood. So the finally, um, the last step would be, uh, that glycogen would be broken down to glucose and then, uh, the glucose can diffuse into the blood. OK, and really quickly, just going through 10, if you were to choose that one, um, explain the role of oxygen in cell elongation in plants. So this one is pretty straightforward. This one wants you to talk about the um, acid growth um, hypothesis. So the fact that, you know, maybe mention that oxygen is produced in the meristems and it stimulates your proton pumps. 
um, which makes the um, environment of the cell wall more acidic, um, which not only means that the bonds will be broken down, but that uh, some low pH enzymes um, are activated or are in their optimum pH range, um, which results in the whole sort of integrity of the cell wall to loosen a little bit. And then it will it allows the cell to grow by um, turbo pressure. OK. And finally, describe the role of abscisic acid in the closure of stomata. So the way I would think about this is if you um, so you know that abscisic acid is a stress hormone. So it is um, produced in dry conditions. And that's why you want your um, stomata to close. It's not to um, get rid of more water. So if you go through sort of why it's open. Um, so in the normal in the scenario where the stomata is open, your um, protons are pumped out of the cell and your um, potassium channels are open. Um, and so the water potential drops, which um, results in your cells to be, become turgid. And because you have that unevil thickening of the wall, um, the stomata sort of curve around and open. So when abscisic acid is produced, it's thought to um, stop this process um, by closing your uh, proton pumps. Um, and therefore, um, your potassium leaves and, um, uh, and the stomata close. So, yeah, again, I think these are the key points. Um, more details in the mark scheme, but I, I don't think that there is um, any reason why I should um, go through that. Um, so hopefully that made sense. Um, so, yeah, good luck and uh, thanks for listening.